Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to chat with Tony Khan to discuss the upcoming AEW Dynasty pay-per-view event right here in St. Louis, one of the great professional wrestling cities in the United States or, for that matter, the world. A, a few reminders. As always, we want to give as many of you the opportunity to speak with Tony, so please know two-parted questions. And another reminder, we've come together to talk about Dynasty, so if we can keep it on task, that would be wonderful. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony for some opening thoughts, and we're going to open the lines for your questions. Tony, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jim. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited about this pay-per-view. I think AEW Dynasty is going to be an amazing show. It should be a great weekend. Uh, we're going to Jim Woodcock's hometown, and uh, this whole week is probably uh, the closest I've ever had to a hometown loop. Uh, driving through I-74, going west from Indianapolis, through Champaign to Peoria, and uh, and then heading to St. Louis. So it'll be great. And like Jim said, St. Louis is an amazing wrestling town with a great history. And hopefully we can do something to continue that great tradition of pro wrestling in the Gateway City. Dynasty is going to be a great show. Thank you all for coming to talk about the show today. And I'll try to get through as many questions as I can, and hopefully some of you will be joining us Sunday at the pay-per-view also, and if I don't get to your question today, hopefully I'll see you there, and I'll try to take everybody's questions, anybody who comes to the show. And uh, with that, Jim, let's start talking about AEW Dynasty, please. All right, sounds wonderful. So we're going to start with Dominic D'Angelo from adfreeshows.com, and after Dominic, Jason Powell from prowrestling.net will be next. Dominic, you are up. Hey, Dom. Hey. Uh, so looking forward to Dynasty this weekend. Should be a good show. The card looks very stacked. Uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the big topic throughout the past couple of weeks of the airing of that footage of uh, All In and lead to the Bucks and FTR going here. Uh, G I wanted to get your personal opinion on thinking about, do you understand? It was kind of universally panned across online and everything like that. And you kind of see some of that reception going on, I'm sure. Uh, do you kind of understand that criticism or where do you, where's your head kind of at when it comes to airing that footage and making that decision? After the ratings came in, uh, felt like when the TBS called me and told me good job, you have to remember that I'm responsible for everybody's jobs in this company. And it is really important for us to please the network, and TBS was really happy with that show and that performance. That's the most important thing. And our fan feedback on the show that we got, uh, you know, the rating is the number one source of fan feedback in the end for the network, and they were incredibly pleased. It was over 400,000 viewers in the 18 to 49 demographic, and that was a strong performance. And that is how TBS judges the show, and how TBS judges the show is the most important metric I have for the performance. Uh, and then the fan reception, last night we had an amazing crowd. The fans were rabid, they were really excited, they were red hot in particular for that match involving the Young Bucks, FTR got big chance, and I think people are really excited to see Young Bucks teaming up this weekend with Okada to take on Pac and FTR and get a preview of that big ladder match at Dynasty. I'm very much excited about it. I do think that what we did last week added a lot of intrigue to this match, and I'm very excited for the Dynasty pay-per-view. I think it's going to be a great pay-per-view, and I am very happy about how we got here. Thank you very much, Don. Thanks. Jason Powell from ProWrestling.net will be next, followed by Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. Jason, you are up. Scenario in which you would step down as head of creative and hire a booker to run AEW, or do you consider your position to be permanent? That's a great question. Uh, well, uh, I would certainly, uh, at some point, you know, we'd have, have to see where we're at. I think... Uh, with all positions, you know, nobody lasts forever. And eventually that's something, uh, you know, with any position in any of the organizations I'm in, that will be a reality. I think uh, 
whether it's the Jaguars or Forum or AEW or True Media. Uh, you know, I won't be here forever. So, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely one of the highlights of my life, being able to be involved in these shows, work on these shows, and, and do creative planning. And I'm having more fun than ever right now. Uh, really loved last night's show. I thought last night was a really strong go-home dynamite leading into this pay-per-view. And, uh, you know, I take it year to year, moment to moment, and really loving what we're doing right now. I'm only 41 years old, and uh, I feel like the company's in a really strong place, and uh, some of the greatest wrestlers in the world are very loyal to me personally, and I really am very proud of that. And uh, hopefully you can continue to do my best to repay them. And I think right now the company's in a very strong place. We just had a valuation, I understand, of $2 billion placed on AEW today for a sports startup, They're the fastest rising sports startup of all time and the most successful sports startup in the world since the American Football League, the AFL, that later merged with the NFL. Uh, I don't see that same future for us, but I do love the comparison, and I think the numbers are quite real, and frankly, uh, the story is very exciting for AEW that, look, we are uh, – we are a major player in the sports scene, and it's going to be a really big year for our company coming up with our media rights renewal, and it's the most important thing right now for the wrestlers and the staff and everybody that works at AEW and, and for our fans and everybody that follows AEW. And another really important aspect of this is the pay-per-view growth. We've grown the business, and last year we expanded the pay-per-view calendar, and we had our by far – biggest year ever on pay-per-view, and we expect it to continue this year. We saw the average go up last year while we increased shows, this year expanding the calendar, and the expansion is this show. This is the added show, Dynasty, the one that happens this weekend, and this is a stack card. It's one of my favorite cards we've ever put together, and the build we've done to get here, there have been some tremendous moments. Last night was a really good go-home show. And on these calls, I, these calls are usually on the Thursday after the go-home dynamite. And we've actually spent a decent amount of time. When I say we, it's, you know, the collection of us that are often on these calls, myself and a lot of you, the top wrestling media, we've spent a lot of time talking about the science of the go-home show and the different ways they're put together and what, you know. I think this was one of our best-received go-home shows we've ever done. And this was... Uh, Really, for me, uh, it's always exciting, and there's a risk when you add a new event, change the calendar, do something like creating a new show that is AEW Dynasty. And, and so far, the build, the card, it's all very exciting, and it's all shaping up for a great event this weekend on Sunday on Pay-Per-View. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics will go next, and I will follow Brandon with a write-in from Kimmy Sokol from the Pop Break. Brandon, you are up. As always, for your time. I was wondering if you could clear up something that was raised by, uh, in Punk's interview a few weeks ago. He said that he personally paid for all of the medical expenses related to his 2022 triceps injury. I was wondering, if, can you say if there's any truth to that? And more broadly, is there a policy that AEW pays for medical expenses related to injuries that happen at AEW? We typically do pay those expenses. I'd have to look into that. Uh, I can't say for sure. It doesn't sound right to me. If that is the case, uh, you know, then I would reimburse them, honestly. I don't think that's – I didn't think that was the case, and, and it doesn't sound right. Uh, so I would have to look into that. Um, you know, that's a good question, but – doesn't, you know, typically we do cover those medical expenses, especially for something that occurred in the ring as that did. So I would have to look into that. But, uh, no, I'm not sure about that. I can't say for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. I'm going to go with the right in here from Kimmy Sokol from the Pop Break and then Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy. You will follow Tony's response to Kimmy, who asks, this weekend, Thunder Rosa is going after the title she never truly lost. How would you assess her comeback, and what is your excitement for the match this weekend? 
I'm very excited about Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm, the Thunderstorm, the, the Battle of Thunderstorm for the AEW Women's World Championship. It's been great having Thunder Rosa back. She had been out with an injury for a very long time, and we weren't sure when she was going to be able to come back. And uh, it's been awesome, the return of Thunder Rosa, her involvement in this story. I think she's had some strong matches since her return, and what a great promo last Saturday on Collision. And she got involved again, smearing the lipstick on Tony Storm, uh, at Dynamite last night in Indianapolis. It was a great event, and it was a great moment, and I'm very excited for that match. I think uh, Thunder Rosa is one of our top stars in the women's division going back many years and has built a great rivalry with Timeless Tony Storm. I think Timeless Tony Storm has been a great champion so far, and this would be uh, not only uh, a great challenge, and a great challenger, uh, but a really, really important title fight on a great show this weekend on Dynasty this Sunday. I'm very excited for that match. I think it's a great card, and uh, that is a great rivalry, Thunder Rosa versus Timeless Tony Storm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kimmy. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy is next, and after uh, Amy will be Liam Crowley from Comic Book. Amy. Dynasty card, and I'm particularly excited about the women's championship matches that are on the show. But I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up a developing story in the news this week with AEW and the Oklahoma State Athletic Commission. Can you share your thoughts on OSAC putting out a warning for having Nyla Rose wrestle in the state of Oklahoma? Thank you for your time. Yes. Uh, well, I would like to talk about that story with the Oklahoma State Athletic Commission and the warning they issued against AEW when we featured Nyla Rose on the show in Oklahoma City last December. I was really surprised by this. It was not something I was expecting. And of course, I was disappointed by the commission's position and by that warning. I don't think we did anything wrong. I'm really, really shocked by it. I don't think there should be discrimination against transgender wrestlers or transgender people at all. And, you know, they have rights. And to that end, I absolutely stand by Nyla Rose. AEW stands behind Nyla Rose and all transgender people who want to play sports. And, and this is wrestling. There is nothing wrong with it. Nyla Rose is a great wrestler. She's been a great world champion. And I love Nyla. I love working with Nyla. Uh, she's been a great part of our history. She was the first transgender world champion ever. And she's a great part of the AEW Together program. She does a ton for the community. She's a, gr she's a great person with a great heart and very supportive of the other wrestlers. One of the funniest people on social media uh, I personally have uh, nominated Nyla to TBS for the best social media presence on more than one occasion over the years, and she's an AEW original. She's been part of this team since 2019, going back to the very first year of AEW, the first shows, uh, the first Dynamite. And look at everything Nyla's accomplished, and, you know, to – just put that label on her. That's not right. She's much more than that. And, uh, you know, she's a great athlete. And I hope everybody can look at Nyla and, and see that she's a great wrestler, a great person, and uh, she deserves the same chances as everybody else. And if the AEW locker room, which consists of people from all over the world, all kinds of different backgrounds, all different beliefs, if everybody in the locker room can embrace Nyla, I would hope that the Oklahoma Commission could do the same thing. Uh, so I'd, I'd also like to mention, speaking of Dynasty, Nyla is working with one of our new pay-per-view partners for the domestic digital presentation of AEW Dynasty, ppb.com. 
I was going to be a special guest host for the PPV.com AEW Dynasty event. Uh, we're very happy about that. We were thrilled when she accepted the invitation weeks ago, and we're all excited about all the different ways you can watch this pay-per-view. This is going to be the most widely available event for digital distribution domestically ever in the history of AEW. And for AEW Dynasty, there's a lot of choices, of course. Nyla is going to be there on PPV.com, and we have great providers with Triller TV, YouTube, and our longtime base at Bleacher Report. Uh, we really appreciate Bleacher Report and Warner Brothers Discovery working with AEW to make sure our fans have a lot of options to watch the pay-per-view, and uh, I'm glad Nyla is going to be hosting that. We, that's something that's been in the works for a while. I think the world of Nyla, and that's you know, that's how I feel about it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Liam Crowley from Comic Book is next, and Liam will be followed by Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT. Liam, you are next. Hi, Tony. Thanks for the time today. Uh, I was super stoked to see John Moxley kick off Dynamite last night as the new IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, moving forward with his schedule, I'm just curious about his presence on AEW TV, how that will be impacted by his New Japan commitments. And also on that note, do you have the sanction to decide if and when he can defend that title on AEW programming or AEW pay-per-views, or is that something you need to get approved by New Japan first? Well, it's really exciting to have John Moxley back in AEW and back in AEW as the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. It's truly a lifelong dream for John Moxley, and it's a dream for me to have a great IWGP heavyweight champion here on Dynamite. It's a dream come true, and, and John, whether it's Dynamite, Rampage, Collision, he's been on all the shows. He's an AEW original dating back to our very first show five years ago, and uh, John Moxley's a fan favorite. He's a great leader and a great world champion for any company. And it's so special to have Mox working with AEW and New Japan and as the world champion here. And uh, absolutely, it's a great partnership between AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, it's a championship that is sanctioned by New Japan Pro Wrestling and Ghetto is the matchmaker there. Uh, we share a person who's very close to both of us. Rocky Romero is a vice president in both companies and is a great intermediary and partner for both of us. And uh, we work together very closely. And to sanction the championship, that is Ghetto's decision. If the championship is defended in AEW, then it's a mutual decision. And whenever Mox will be out there defending the title, whatever the future of Mox as the champion in New Japan is, uh, we look forward to working really closely with New Japan Pro Wrestling on these dates and on this amazing journey and this great milestone that John Moxley is the IWGP world champion now. It's great. Thank you very much, Liam. Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT is next, and I'm going to follow Samantha with a write-in from Jeremy Housewright from Review STL. Samantha. Samantha? Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Amy and Emily's question for a moment, and you gave a wonderful response about Nyla. With the warning, will this um, keep you from running shows in Oklahoma or other states that have transgender um, or have bans on transgender athletes? And if you do decide to perform in these states, will you have Nyla perform and risk whatever uh, warning or fines that they uh, they may impose on you? Uh, all I can say is we have a great plan for our shows in 2024 and 2025. Uh, we've got a great new team working on routing, and uh, 
to take all of this into consideration. I definitely am uh, treating this as a developing story. I was kind of surprised by this, but uh, definitely want to do our best to support the fans across America and all over the world and bring AEW Wrestling everywhere. We have great fans. Uh, we have great fans in Oklahoma that are important to us and great fans all over the country. And so we'll do anything we can to support those fans. So it's uh, something we're going to have to think about. But, uh, you know, it's a fair question. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Samantha. Here's a write-in, Tony, from Jeremy Housewright from Review STL. And once, you're, once you've uh, responded to Jeremy, Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone will be next. Jeremy's question, given the pro wrestling history that St. Louis has, do you think it's fitting to have such an instant classic like Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay here in St. Louis? Uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question about Brian? I, I'm not sure. I, I might have missed uh, one second with the audio there, Jim. Sure. What was that? He, it, Jeremy asked the same question I would ask, and that is, given the, uh, the pro wrestling history here in St. Louis, do you think it's fitting that such an instant classic is ahead for us here uh, with Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay? What a great question. It does sound like you wrote that one yourself, Jim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a great question. I'm very excited for AW Dynasty this weekend. It's going to be a great pay-per-view for all the fans across the world to watch this Sunday. And we're going to have an amazing live crowd on hand in St. Louis at the Chaffetz Arena for this amazing event, and certainly people around the world are talking about this dream match, Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay. I cannot wait for this match. I'm so excited about Danielson versus Ospreay on Sunday at pay-per-view. It's going to be a sight to be seen. It's going to be a great match when uh, Will Ospreay locks up with the American Dragon, Brian Danielson. In my opinion, these are two of the greatest wrestlers I've ever seen in my entire life. And to have a first-time matchup like this, it's really, really thrilling. Uh, it's been a sports-based presentation. We've had a lot of great rivalries developing in many different ways. And I think that's been one of the really cool things. You know, the build to a lot of the different matches on the card has been very different. This has really been a more of a pure sports focus build to get to Osprey versus Danielson because this is a real wrestling dream match and I think that's taken center stage so there haven't been as many brawls between these guys and uh, the presentation has been different than a lot of the other matches on the card and I think that each of them each of the big matches has its own unique presentation for the most part. And I think that's a really exciting thing about the Dynasty pay-per-view card. But certainly, fans around the world are really excited to see Brian Danielson versus Will Ospreay. And I know I'm very, very excited for that match. I think it's going to be excellent. And it should just be a great card. And I think Danielson versus Ospreay is emblematic of what we have planned for AEW Dynasty should be a all-time great AEW show this Sunday, I expect. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone will go next and follow there after Tony responds to Bill, Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer. Bill, you are up. Bill, go ahead. Oh, okay. Couldn't hear anything. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about the decision to, uh, if this is the right way to phrase it, open up the options for the for the domestic pay per view um, outlets. I know there's been some issues with Bleacher Report. It kind of came to a head with the ROH pay per view. Um, so I just wanted to know if you could explain why, you know, outside of the obvious issues with broadcasting it, why it took so long to open it up, um, and if we could expect uh, all future events after, I think it was announced, the the, the next three pay-per-views, if, if this is going to on, be ongoing after those three events. 
I'm optimistic it'll continue that we're able to deliver the AEW digital pay-per-view events on multiple streaming platforms. And this is the most digital distribution we've ever had for any AEW event for AEW Dynasty this weekend, which is really exciting. There are so many great options uh, depending on what platforms you use, what kind of devices you watch pay-per-views on. Uh, there would be lots of options to watch AEW Dynasty. I think it's really cool that Warner Brothers Discovery has given us all these options. For a long time, Bleacher Report had been an exclusive platform, and I think that's been beneficial to us because it's helped bring us closer to Warner Brothers Discovery, which is our amazing media partner and uh, an incredibly important relationship for us. And then, then for them to allow us to use multiple digital partners for distribution of AEW Dynasty and the upcoming pay-per-view events, that's really exciting for us. It allows us to reach even more fans now and do all of it with the blessing of our amazing media partner now that we've established uh, that we have this great presence on Bleacher Report and now touching other platforms. I think it's awesome, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's a great step for us. I can't say for sure what will happen after the next three events other than to say we will still have great digital distribution regardless, and uh, I'm optimistic and excited about the opportunity to distribute these upcoming shows on multiple platforms that was granted to us by our amazing media partners at Warner Brothers Discovery uh, who have been so great to us at AEW. Thank you very much for asking. Appreciate that, Bill. Uh, Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer will go next, followed by Ella J, a a wrestling gal. Dave. Maybe there. Dave, can you hear us? Dave, are you muted? He's unmuted. How about if we try Ella J, and then we can come back to Dave. Is Ella ready to go? Ella, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Go yeah, ahead, Ella. Okay. We'll try to okay. get you in a minute. Okay. Hi, Tony. Um, I wanted to ask you about your decision to book a winner-takes-all match for the ROH six-man titles and the AEW trios titles, specifically wondering if these titles will be unified at AEW Dynasty or what the plan is going forward after this match concludes. Yeah, absolutely. The winner of the match will be the undisputed world trios champions. I think that's very cool. Uh, and it'll create a lot of great opportunities for the top trios out there. Uh, and I think it's it's very exciting, uh, you know, the cons some consolidation and unification of championships. Uh, and we have two great trios here, the Acclaimed and Billy Gunn, who won their championships uh, dating back last year, and with Jay White and the Guns. And I have a ton of respect for all six men. They have a lot of history with each other. And it should be an excellent match. We had an injury this past week. And I had been waiting to confirm this match on the card. Uh, just to, you know, give you guys a, a look behind the curtain at the process. And when we got the clearance from the doctors, I was really excited to be able to add this match to the card. And I know the fans in St. Louis will be excited to see these wrestlers, and it's something fun for the fans all over the world. We're going to have a great card on the Zero Hour, and even if you can't afford to buy the pay-per-view, you'll be able to watch that great wrestling, and that's a great way to get people all over the world watching, and that's available on YouTube and all the pay-per-view platforms, the pre-show going into AEW Dynasty that we'll have this Sunday. Um, should be a great match. Thanks for asking, Ella. Thank you, Ella. 
Uh, we're going to try Dave Meltzer again, and then I'm going to follow with a, um, a, a write-in from Steve Fall from 10 Count. Dave, you there? Hello. There you are. Hey, Dave. Hey. Uh, um, okay, so um, with the first quarter being over and kind of just going through that Forbes story, um, when it comes to uh, comparisons to Q1 in 2023 and Q1 in 2024, um, how much can you say as far as like, is, there, is everything kind of the same? Is um, revenue up? Is it up substantially? Is it profit loss? Yes. Kind of like... Business overview of Q1 2023 versus Q1 2024, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you, Dave. It, it, yes, uh, Q1 2024, the revenue is significantly up. We've run more events. Uh, we've added AEW Collision, and AEW Dynamite is strong. We've had good attendance, uh, you know, in, in some markets year over year, attendance up, and in particular, a lot of really successful shows in this run, like great events, in, including uh, Boston, Toronto, AEW Revolution uh, was one of our top U.S. gates ever. And then on the pay-per-view side, AEW Revolution in Q1 is one of the biggest AEW pay-per-view shows of all time. It was our biggest pay-per-view since last year's AEW All In and uh, it surpassed last year's Revolution. Uh, Last year's Revolution did really, really well. It was one of the best pay-per-view shows of the year. A lot of people thought it was the best pay-per-view show of the year. It included uh, MJF versus Brian Danielson in the 60-minute Iron Man match and a lot of great wrestling, great show. This year, the show did even better. The gate was up, uh, and the pay-per-view buys were significantly up for what was Sting's final encounter, the last pro wrestling match of Sting. On a personal level, it's probably the greatest thing I've ever been a part of and the greatest night I've ever been a part of. And it was a very successful business. So with more shows, uh, more pay-per-view revenue, it's been uh, more revenue this year. So uh, big growth there and, and a lot of opportunities. Also, our rights fee was higher with the 2024 option getting picked up versus 2023 for Dynamite and the addition of more shows. Uh, you know, we had significantly higher revenue in 2024. So uh, it is a, you know, big growth and also big opportunities going into the media rights renewal year and continuing to grow the business going into 2025. Thanks for asking, Dave. Thank you, Dave. So Steve Fall from 10 Count, his, his questions are right in, Tony. I'm going to follow Steve with Jonathan Hood, who also has a right in. So first from Steve from 10 Count, why did you release the 2024 AEW pay-per-view schedule so early in the year? Uh, well, we have a great new chief operating officer, Koshe Irby, and this was an initiative from our uh, live events and marketing and arena booking teams to get out in advance, allow fans to make their plans for people who want to travel, uh, get the schedule out early. It's very different than what we had done before. I think it's really exciting for the fans, and it seems like it's been really well received. Koshe is a brilliant guy, and the team he's putting together has had a lot of great ideas that have been very additive to AEW, and we're going to continue trying to grow the business, and I think he's been a great addition to the team. We've got a great group with Koshe on the live event side and Mike Mansuri overseeing global production and a great, great group of people on those teams uh, helping us make a plan for these events uh, going forward. And we're already working on 2025's pay-per-view shows. There's a lot of exciting opportunities uh, in terms of a lot of great markets in America that we have done events in and also great markets in America where we have yet to bring a pay-per-view that I think would thrive and would be excellent choices for pay-per-views as well as international events. So a lot of really cool opportunities uh, this year and next year. And I thought it was a great idea 
to get out and announce the 2024 pay-per-view calendar well in advance for many of the events, put the whole calendar out recently, and uh, I'm glad it's been so well received. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Steve. And Jonathan Hood from Good Karma Wrestling and ESPN Radio in Chicago, his question is sort of a, in the same spirit there, and that is, what are some of the cities and arenas that AEW hasn't been to yet that you'd like to bring AEW programming to in the near future? Well, there's so many countries that I'd like to visit. When You know, it's kind of amazing. All the AEW shows we've done have been in the U.S., Canada, or England. And those are incredible markets. Those are some of my favorite places in the world. And uh, that, you know, U.S., Canada, and U.K., frankly, probably represents where I personally spend 99.9% of my personal time. But I would like to get out and bring AEW to all these other great places around the world. There's places in America and Canada and the U.K. that we haven't been to yet. There's great cities in, in those territories that we still haven't covered. And I'm excited to make our debut in many of those places, but there's also great countries all over the world where we have yet to bring AEW. And these are places where we have great media partners that can help us plan. You know, we're working with ESPN in Australia and New Zealand. That's pretty exciting. Uh, and we have great media partners in Germany, Italy, all over Europe. A lot of exciting opportunities. Uh, and certainly in the, the places we have been wrestling and the media partners we have have been great. And there's still uncharted, uh, rather uncovered territory for us there. So uh, I think it's really cool and uh, absolutely would love to bring AEW to uh, more first-time cities still in 2024 and going into 2025. I think there's tons of great opportunities there to break new ground for AEW. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, so I've got Arunava Goshal from Sports Kita will be next, followed by Jalen Doherty from ESPN Radio in Owensboro. Arunava, uh, you're up next. Being online, the reaction, uh, sorry, the reactions Young Bucks have been receiving over their great character work. So if you could let us know how much creative input you have and how much the Bucks have in creating this su successful change that we have been noticing. It's been a lot of fun. It's a partnership. And they had great ideas. And uh, it's funny. I, I think I can say this. Not only we have the right media partner with Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, but also I was very fortunate uh, to befriend Jesse Armstrong Recently, Jesse Armstrong being a Fulham supporter, and uh, uh, he got caught by the wrestling media and uh, sitting with me at a Fulham match recently uh, at Craven Cottage. And in addition to being a Fulham supporter, Jesse Armstrong is such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer. And it turned out that he's a really, really nice guy, too. I really have enjoyed talking to him. And he uh, inadvertently... It helped inspire this change. Matt and Nick mentioned to me, we were talking about changes for 2024, and they, they asked about something inspired by succession. And then I had a meeting with them and a lot of the team in Jacksonville on January 10th in Daly's Place. And it was kind of surreal because Matt and Nick and I had spent days and days and days of our lives, when you add it all up, just probably weeks of our lives, actually, in this office in Daly's Place in Jacksonville, when you add all the time up and spent a ton of time in there with many different people over the years, including Kenny, Cody, Chris Jericho, John Moxley, FTR, and a lot of other people that have been here over the years. And I was in there with Matt and Nick and a ton of our production staff, including some people that were new to Daily's Place, like Mike Mansuri and a lot of the staff that had joined us in the past couple of years. And Matt and Nick had some ideas, and I had a, a, a big vision for where we would go. And I remember on January 10th, Matt and Nick had a, an idea of a presentation that was their idea and has been tremendous of utilizing succession. So I was able to just tell Jesse straight up to his face, you know, <laughs> that, uh, there are wrestlers in our show that have been very inspired by succession. And 
their theme song may or may not be very similar to the Succession theme song. Uh, he was he was very kind about it. Uh, and uh, Matt and Nick brought that up, and I thought it was such a great idea. I'm such a big Succession fan, and I thought it was a great idea for them. So we started working on that late last year. And then January 10th, we had this meeting in Jacksonville. And it was a really good meeting, and I laid out ideas for upcoming events. And so far, it has all played out exactly like we talked about, and it was such a great meeting. And and I'm really excited about where we're at now, but it's fun to look back because it was January 10th, and that was the night they came out to challenge Sting and Darby for Revolution. And, and then the things that came after that, Sting and Darby winning the Tag Team Championship, the Tag Team Championship, uh, you know, being then vacated after Sting and Darby versus the Young Bucks at Revolution and creating an opportunity for this great tag team tournament and building something, this rivalry now that we have at TR versus Young Bucks in the tournament final and heating up one of the best rivalries in AEW and making it feel fresh and new and 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 talking about all this, by the way, in Daly's Place, the, you know, the site of the original FTR versus Young Bucks match. Personally, I could feel the creative juices f- flowing through me and, and in the room. And, you know, something that came up in there, I mentioned Okada. And I thought Okada's arrival would be tremendous. And that on the Dynamite after Revolution, when we vacated the championships and started to build towards this tournament, that we'd have this great final with FTR versus the Young Bucks. I also mentioned, I think, Okada coming in will be perfect and the, the group of Okada and the Young Bucks and uh, they fit together like a glove and you know it's unthinkable it really makes Matt and Nick terrible villains on TV they've just embraced it and Matt and Nick are so great in these roles and also they're great partners with Okada the three of them have this chemistry i would seen in real life and I feel like it's like you know Taking my experience in Hollywood, you know, we're in uh, artist management and production and uh, as a partner in activist artist management, what I've said to a lot of my media partners and friends is it reminds me of if you saw a group of actors together at a party and you saw the chemistry, but they had never done a film together or a project together. And you say, geez, this should be the movie. Look at the chemistry with you guys. And the thought of, the Young Bucks firing Kenny Omega of all people, and then uh, how sacrilegious and terrible it would be for these guys to replace Kenny Omega with with Okada of all people. What an insult to Kenny! And for Matt and Nick, after everything they've done with Kenny, after everything Kenny's done for AEW and the Elite, to fire him so ungrateful, especially while he's sick and he can't even, you know, uh, go out and wrestle. I mean, he's you know the company's obviously taking care of Kenny, and Kenny's being paid, so he's, he's not like he's stuck. It's not like he, he's destitute, but he's, he's unable to wrestle. He can't be here. It's not fair. And they fired him. And I, I just think it's, it's great heat, and it's, it, it, it's a great opportunity for the future. And this team with Okada and the Young Bucks, I've really enjoyed working with them. They had an amazing match last night, and, the, and you see the presentation and the, and the details and all the nuanced things that Matt and Nick and Okada do. And... And then when you think how that really new that group is and how, how great they all are together, it's, it's scary. Uh, certainly Okada has taken to American wrestling television incredibly quickly, and I'm not at all surprised by that. I predicted it. And in that room on January 10th, I was saying, I think this can, guy can come in and be a franchise heel and do something very different than what he's been doing, what he's done. And I bet with Matt and Nick working with him and, and with all of us talking and, and collaborating that Okada would come in and be a great centerpiece star for AEW, which he has done. And tons of credit to Matt and Nick and Okada for this. And now they, they all three of them have these huge championship matches at AEW Dynasty this Sunday. I cannot wait for Okada versus Pac for the Continental Championship. And that'll be a very different kind of match than the World Tag Team Championship match the ladder match, the finals of the tournament, FTR versus the Young Bucks. It's like I said, it's FTR versus Young Bucks four. There have been three previous chapters in this rivalry. All have been excellent matches, uh, Jacksonville, Boston, and London. And 
the rivalry's grown and, and it feels now more heated and bitter than ever. And uh, I love all three of those matches. I love the match we had in Daly's place so much, which was something I brought up when we were talking about this road to dynasty and all the twists and turns we would take from revolution to dynasty. And uh, can't wait for that, that ladder match. Obviously that'll be a very different thing than the continental title. Uh, and uh, really, really uh, all the credit in the world to the elite for this new act and this new presentation, it's, it's been really a fun thing to see, and it's a, it's a great part of AEW right now. I thought the match last night on Dynamite was excellent, and I'm really looking forward to the pay-per-view and also this Saturday for free. Everybody can watch FTR teaming with Pac versus Young Bucks and Okada, the elite. Should be a great preview of the action we're going to see on Dynasty on Sunday, and everybody can watch that for free on TNT this Saturday, and it's a great way to spend 420 Thanks. Thank you, Arunaba. Jalen Doherty from ESPN Radio in Owensboro is next. I will follow Jalen with a write-in from Andrew Badala from SNE Network. Jalen. Yeah, can you hear me, guys? We can. Yep, we hear you. All right, hey, Tony. Uh, so you're on the heels of what is uh, perhaps one of the best AEW cards in history, but you're without some of your biggest superstars. You know, uh, no Maxwell Jacob Friedman, no Britt Baker, no Jamie Hayter, no Sammy Guevara. You know, a uh, rumor going around you guys are going to be uh, bringing in uh, the Motor City Machine Guns. You know, what's the uh, the status on some of these, uh, the guys on the injury report and some uh, some of the free agents like the, uh, the Motor City Machine Guns going into Dynasty? Well, sir, I appreciate it. You sound like a real wrestling fan, and I, I love to hear it. Uh, I... I am really proud of the AEW Dynasty card. We have, I believe, an awesome lineup for this pay-per-view. It has the potential to be one of the greatest events ever in AEW, and we've done some incredible pay-per-views. I think we're coming off arguably our best show ever for AEW Revolution. It's my personal favorite. Uh, my personal favorites, uh, you know, it, it might be uh, if I had to do a Mount Rushmore, I'm, you know, last year's All In and All Out, and then... Uh, this year's revolution and the original revolution, that would be pretty good. And honestly, then I would say it's pretty hard to not have a Daily's Place show on there too. Double or nothing 2021 maybe uh, might be the fifth one. But but definitely, uh, uh, you know, we're coming off one of my favorite pay-per-views. And this is a new event. It's the first ever AEW Dynasty. Uh, you know, just mentioned the inaugural, inaugural revolution is one of my favorite events. And the matches on the card had different builds. And it was just, it felt felt like an important moment for the company. And it, it, we had a great crowd that night in Chicago at the Wintrust Arena. Uh, and I was just thinking about that event when I was in the offices of the Wintrust Arena the other day for uh, the great New Japan event last week. And being at that great event, the Windy City New Japan event, uh, brought back a lot of memories of the original revolution. And I was saying to Mox, it's cool being here with you again and you winning your first ever New Japan Pro Wrestling IWGP World Championship. We're here in the same exact arena where Mox won the AEW World Championship for the first time at the Wintrust Arena at the first revolution. And it was a great event. It was a great moment for the company and it was in our first year. And who knew what was ahead of us after that? And now here we are, and it's another debut. And it's a, it's a different event, but certainly it, at Dynasty, it does have that feeling of just something fresh and exciting for the company. And as you said, we have so many of our top wrestlers that are unavailable right now. When you talk about big stars like uh, Kenny Omega, Dr. Britt Baker, and Jamie Hayter, and, uh, of course, MJF, Adam Cole, number of top stars, unavailable and injured. These are people that we love having in AEW. These are some of our biggest stars, and I think it speaks to the high quality and the high standards we set for the locker room and the roster in AEW that we're able to put on one of our best pay-per-view cards ever 
have great shows like the Dynamite last night and this Saturday's 420 card in Peoria. And really very, very pumped uh, for Dynasty. And also, as you've astutely pointed out, I think it's really cool. We're able to put together one of our best pay-per-view cards ever with some great stars sidelined with injuries. And I can't wait to have those stars back and have more great events with them. And uh, the locker room can lift each other up and, and we're able to take care of all these people and they're all collecting the paycheck. And it's because we have this really strong locker room that can support each other when people are hurt and they can lift each other up. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Jalen. So I've got a write-in from uh, Andrew Bedala from SNE Network, and after you answer that, we will conclude with Kristen Ashley from USA Today Sports Media Group. Andrew's question, Tony, is, at this time, is there more of a formulated plan to move to a streaming platform or a possible bundle plan for consumers here in the United States? That's a great question. I think it's something that we'll be looking at and evaluating in the upcoming media rights negotiations. Uh, there's a, excuse me, I muted my phone, I had to sneeze. Uh, and uh, I think there's a great opportunity for uh, AEW and uh, really our media team and uh, all of our fans to present this incredible library that has never really been made available. You know, it's amazing. We've done over 230 episodes of AEW Wednesday Night Dynamite. We've had, uh, you know, hundreds of episodes of uh, Dynamite, Rampage, and now Collision is approaching a one-year anniversary. We've done so many great pay-per-view events, I think, you know, over the past five years, a, a large percentage of the best events on pay-per-view and wrestling have been from AEW. And uh, the whole library uh, has never been in one place together. There's no place to really go back and watch all these dynamites and all these great events. And so an archive library and a place to put streaming events, it's a really interesting idea. And I think it's certainly something that has existed in wrestling, and, and wrestling fans are able to watch a lot of events on streaming, and the AEW events uh, should be up there. And it's something that I expect to happen in our next media rights deal. Uh, we're in an exclusive window right now talking to Warner Brothers Discovery, which is amazing, and it's been a great time with, it, with Warner Brothers Discovery. We're coming up on the five-year anniversary of the debut of AEW on Turner Sports. That is phenomenal to me, and it's really important. And I want to respect our media partner and how important those negotiations are to us. And certainly, uh, we're going to have a great opportunity coming into 2025 to present all of the AEW TV and all of our major pay-per-view events like this Sunday, the first ever AEW Dynasty, and uh, where all these shows live in 2025 is to be determined, which is really exciting for us. So it's a great question, and uh, we'll see where that ends up. Thank you, Andrew. Last question of the day, Tony, comes from Kristen Ashley from the USA Today's Sports Media Group. Kristen. How are you? I'm fantastic. Is that your question? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I just want to start by saying congratulations on the signing of Carlos Cabrera. Um, I know he's absolutely beloved and a veteran in his field. When you also consider your strong partnership with CMLL, these seem like very specific moves. Can you tell us more about your strategy for growth in the Spanish speaking market? It's a, these are great questions. Uh, it's been amazing working with CMLL. They're one of the greatest wrestling organizations in the world. And it's been interesting because Koshe, he had worked recently as the CMO of Clemson at PBR, and he had a, worked as a live events executive in WWE. 
So he does have wrestling experience. And when he came in here, I mentioned to him, you know, this is going to be different than anything you've seen. And he, he said, you're right, because I mentioned I have partnerships and friendships in wrestling. And it's something that really on this level to be uh, an organization, um, you know, with hundreds and millions of dollars in revenues and a multi-billion dollar valuation now, it's uh that you know you have a lot of experience with that in wrestling but what you haven't necessarily seen and and now he's seeing it firsthand is the kind of friendships and partnerships we've built here on trust and loyalty with new japan pro wrestling and now with cmll and these are the most respected wrestling organizations in their respective countries they each have these decades and decades of great traditions and their leaderships are honorable honorable people who really value respect and we've been able to build that mutual respect and trust and it's what led us to launching Forbidden Door and launching now this partnership with CMLL that's seen some of their top stars coming up here and has seen great stars like Brian Danielson, John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli and Matt Seidel uh, going down to Mexico and this has been embraced by all sides. And Salvador, who runs CMLL, has been just great to work with. Uh, Rocky, again, is an amazing intermediary between these companies. And it's really great having Rocky in AEW, but he's also a really fair person who's looking out for the interests of everybody in these things. And I think that's what's really cool is we all trust him. And, uh, you know, it's a very unique situation having a person who holds an office in these two major wrestling promotions in AEW and New Japan, but also Rocky's a big part of the team in CMLL as well. And working with CMLL, I think, has allowed us to bring in some great talent, utilize them. We've seen Mystico, in particular, has come in and built an undefeated record in AEW to match the undefeated record he has since he returned to Mexico and to CMLL. And uh, I look forward to working with CMLL more in the future here in the U.S. and in Mexico and internationally, as well as with New Japan Pro Wrestling. I think it's really cool what is being built. Carlos Cabrera coming in is perfect timing. Mike Mansuri had a lot of great experience working with Carlos for many years. They were very close, and it was Mike's idea. Mike is a fluent Spanish speaker also and had done a lot of production work for WWE on the Spanish speaking side. And I thought it was a great point and it was something the fans brought up. I try to listen to fan feedback and I know that our fans wanted us to upgrade the presentation in Espanol and, and do uh, work to make the best possible presentation for the fans who want the Spanish language version of the shows. And Carlos Cabrera is an excellent commentator and somebody who had a great reputation, and Mike spoke really highly of him. So I was excited to hire Carlos, and he's officially joined the team now this week uh, going into AW Dynasty. And uh, it was great to have Carlos calling Dynamite last night. And it seems like something that's been really well-received by the fans, which is awesome, and hopefully will help us continue to grow our uh, – Latino fan base, and I really uh, am a big fan of CMLL. You know, I, I think it's safe to say that I was the biggest CMLL fan at the University of Illinois, uh, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, uh, and uh, I guess it would be, I guess it would be uh, closer to 20 than 15, sadly, <laughs> but, but uh, I was the biggest CMLL fan uh, 17, 18, 20 years ago at the University of Illinois, and uh, it was really the promotion I was watching the most, and there are so many great wrestlers still competing today, 20 years later, in CMLL, and it was great. Brian got to go work with some of those great stars, including Blue Panther and Mystico, uh, many others, and there's still a lot of opportunities to do a lot more with CMLL and hopefully bring more of their stars up here, work with them, and have Carlos Cabrera now calling their matches. It's very cool. Thank you for asking. 
Thank you, Kristen. <clears throat> Tony, that is our time. Do you have any closing thoughts? Well, it's been great visiting with you all. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for coming to the AEW Dynasty All Media Call. Hopefully we got to answer most of your questions. I know there was a lot of questions and, and maybe we weren't able to get them all in this hour. If you're able to come to St. Louis this weekend or even send in a question, we're going to try to answer them all after the pay-per-view. And if you come to the show, I'm going to do my best to stay and make sure I answer at least a question from every single person who comes to the Scrum. I, I generally try to. I really appreciate all of you covering this event. This is the first ever AEW Dynasty. It would not be possible to grow AEW and launch new events like this and have such a have such an exciting show uh, and so much uh, fan excitement about it without all of you. And I really appreciate all of you. Many of you have been covering AEW since day one, five years ago. Uh, and without all of you, you know, we wouldn't be in this position. So thank you very much for coming today, and hopefully I'll see a lot of you on Sunday at AW Dynasty. And, Jim, thank you. I, I, it's the rare uh, post-pay-per-view scrum where you'll get to go back and sleep in your own bed after the show, so I know you're excited for that, too, and uh, it should be a great show. I may not go to bed. It's going to be that good of a show. So, um, <laughs> But thank you very much, Tony, and, and, and thanks to everybody. Um, we're now at the end of our time. As always, expect an audio recording to be delivered shortly. And uh, also, as always, know how much we appreciate you participating today and for your commitment to covering AW, as Tony mentioned, and professional wrestling. So all of us at AW hope to see you in St. Louis over the weekend, and especially on Sunday night for AW Dynasty at Chaffetz Serena. Uh, with that, a thousand thanks to everyone and safe travels to St. Louis.